you. First, I want to just say thank you again for having me. Thank you to Pastor Shelley. Thanks to all of you. I mean, it's been sweet fellowship. You guys have a great church here, you know, great uh, atmosphere. And, um, you know, my daughter was really excited. She's like, are we going to go to that church? I was like, yeah, you're coming. Don't worry about it. So, and everybody was really, it's been really nice to my family, my wife, and my kids. So I really appreciate it. But uh, keep your Bibles there in uh, Genesis 47. And keep your Bibles in Genesis 47. But before we start, I uh, just want to say, hey, keep praying uh, uh, diligently and, and in a good way. You know, it's not a pity uh, request. It's a power request. Give Pastor Mejia and First Works Baptist Church, just give them boldness. You know, obviously they're under attack by all these sodomites, these queers, and, and you know, they're coming at him hard. That means he's doing something right. He's preaching the word of God. I know that your pastor, Pastor Shelley, believes the same, and a lot of the pastors that we associate with believe the same. And, you know, they already have their destruction. You know, the Bible says that they've been given over, so they're never going to understand. God will protect them, but that he may grow boldly, not only for uh, preaching the message, but also that, you know, that the message would grow further. You know, he's getting all this publicity. Pretty soon he's not going to be just California news. He's going to be all over news. You know, that'll be good news for everybody, right? And uh, this wasn't part of my message, but I thought about it on the way over here. When I was 23, I, like I mentioned earlier this morning, I have uh, two sodomite uncles. And I remember one of them is actually in Hollywood. And he deals with all these Hispanic uh, artists like Jennifer Lopez and George Lope, uh, and George Lope, I, they're the same last name. A bunch of last names that are similar in Hispanic. And uh, I, I got a degree in marketing. And I remember I had graduated just recently and he called me. And I didn't get saved till I was 25, just so you know. So, and he called me, and he wanted me to fly up to Los Angeles and work with him and basically help him build his marketing agency. And then I would uh, then take over. You know, it sounds like a great opportunity. You get to hang out with all these celebrities. And even then, before I was saved, you know, this is how you know they push an agenda. I never liked queers, in fact. And he called me, and I literally told him no, and he was really disappointed in the fact that I wouldn't go out and work with him. And the main reason, and it just came to my mind today, the main reason, the only reason I didn't go with him was exactly that. I didn't want to be part of that lifestyle. Yeah. So don't let the world tell you that that's normal. Right. I wasn't even saved at the time. I got saved two years later. You know, I didn't have the doctrine I have now. Obviously, I didn't have the hatred that I have for them like I have now. And even then, I understood that's not a lifestyle. I didn't even want to. It, it's disgusting. Right. You know, it's, yeah. it's something you don't want to be surrounded with. So anyways, but stay there in... Uh, in Genesis, and you're there in Genesis 47, and the title of my sermon this uh, evening is Actions Speak Louder Than Words. And before we jump into conclusions, uh, I'll, I'll explain this, but uh, this a message is to specifically everybody here, more so than anybody listening. And, and I want to leave with an encouragement, because I know that you guys have been through a lot, but you guys are only on the cusp of great things. I mean, I really think that when you're in the middle of the, the deepest tribulations and and trials, that's really when you, when you turn the corner, it's just going to get that much better. And, and so there in Genesis 47, it says, And Pharaoh spake unto Joseph, saying, Thy father and thy brethren are come unto thee. The land of Egypt is before thee. In the best of the land make thy father and brethren to dwell in the land of Goshen, and let them dwell. And if thou knowest any men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. And it's what, I mean, we're not going to spend too much time just in the story, but that's the only time you find that word activity. And it just really stands out to me because if you turned a few pages back over to Genesis 39, just to set this up before we go into the points, in Genesis 39, verse 1, it says, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt. So he's already been sold. And it says, And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelite, uh, Ishmaelites, which he had brought down, uh, brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and saw that the Lord made him all that he did to prosper in his hands. And Joseph found grace in his sight. And, and Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had put in his hand. And it came to pass from that time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not 
uh, and he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. And then if we just read a couple of verses later in verse 21, obviously he goes to jail and now, you know, he's been falsely accused. And it says, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all that the prisoners that were in the prison and whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. And so we see here that Joseph is that principle that we've learned in the New Testament that if you're faithful over a few things, you're going to get you know, leadership over many. And Joseph is a great example of just someone who was faithful and what is, what's the ultimate ending of it all? Right there in Genesis 47, not only is he in charge of, you know, the famine and gathering the, 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 the grains and the food and everything, but he's also in charge of delegating out some of the tasks that Pharaoh, Pharaoh says, now it's your turn to delegate these tasks. And Pharaoh spake unto Joseph, saying, Thy father and brethren come unto thee, in Genesis 47, and the land of Egypt is before thee. In the best of the land make thy father and brethren to dwell in the land of, Gosh, of Goshen that dwell with them. And if thou knowest any men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. And what you want to do is, you know, leadership has to be able to delegate, but who are they going to look to delegate to? They're going to look to delegate to men of activity. Right. You know, people who are going to get the job done. And so what I mean by actions speak louder than words is that's a common term in society, right? And it's usually a positive term of, you know, you want to be able to not just talk the talk, but walk the walk, right? But with us as Christians, we don't have to have just our actions speak louder than words. Our words can match our actions, so like just like Joseph did, you know. And we're going to go into that a little bit. And what I want to leave you with today, and it's kind of a tie-in from this morning. You'll see, you'll hear a lot of overlap. Is you know you need to be able to take the proper type of action, and that's why that was a foundational message this morning about you know how you should be able to respond, what we feed our mind, how we're going to prepare, you know, every day for the spiritual battle. But you know this message, it. it and obviously, you always want to preach to the saved, but sometimes there's unsaved people in, in, in the congregation, and you know there's going to be unsaved people listening. But it, you know this is specifically for you that are serving here, for you that are, are are saved, that you know you've been in this battle, you've been in here since day one, and maybe not day one, but from the beginning, it's still a, a fairly young church, and you've been delegated tasks, and you have a duty, not only to your pastor, but more importantly to God. You know, it actually doesn't really matter who's behind the pulpit, although Pastor Shelley is a great leader. But what matters is how you're, how you're uh, viewed in God's eyes. Amen. See, and, and people don't do things just to be seen of men. Do things to serve God. And, it, you know, you guys are in a, in a position where we're in a city where we still don't get that kind of persecution. Right. You know, I know that there's been hard sermons preached from this pulpit, much harder than what I preached this morning. Nobody's out there protesting, you know, like they are right now in, in other churches. Yeah. So we need to take advantage of that and preach the word even more. We shouldn't be apathetic to the fact that we have it easy. If anything, we should, you know, get the, get the getting while it's good, yep. right? right. Because it might not be that good in a couple of years, and we're still going to have to go get the getting, but right now is a great time. Right. And we got, we got to go recruit more soldiers to Christ. Mm -hmm. So, you know... Uh, let me just make sure I got all my notes right here. Okay, I, I already repeat all that. I, say, I don't usually write notes like uh, specifically of what I say and then because it, it does that, but I, I already covered because I usually do cover it in my mind, but I want to make sure I covered everything today. So, uh, but in 1 Corinthians 6.19, in the meantime, you turn over to Psalm 145, but in 1 Corinthians 6.19, the Bible says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a prize, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. And so, you know, when I, when, I, when I bring this, I guess you could call it a teaser, but we should have our actions match our word. But most of the time, the world is, is trying to convince you, and this is more from also this morning, is they're always trying to convince you of just one or the other. You know, I did a, a little bit of a, because I've been in sales all my life. So, you know, I've heard different things, you know, body language or nonverbal cues. 
uh, make up a bigger percentage than verbal cues. They really do in, in the world, right? And the challenge, though, is that we should always match what we're saying. You know, the world has you so trained to just listen to words that you don't pay attention to the things that are going on. You know, I mean, you turn on, and I know I brought it up, but it, it, this has been going on for years, but if you were to turn on CNN right now, I, I haven't watched CNN in years, but I'm pretty sure they still have the Situation Room, right? And it's like these big red letters. It's the Situation Room. Something's going on. There's a situation. And all it is is meant to just, you know, get you plugged in, into fear or panic or anxiety or whatnot, right? But you're not then paying attention to the actions that are following. And um, and what you see is that people, I think now we have what, Facebook and Twitter, and I, I think there's, you guys have Twitch, and I've seen all these different things. I don't know now, there's Parler and, and Rumble and The Jungle, I, I don't know, there's all kinds of stuff, right? I mean, it's just like every day there's a new social media, but what do they focus on? It's just the the, the words. The nonverbal, right? And, and what they're they're not having you look at the whole body. But what does the Bible say? Our temple is the body of God. We have a whole duty to present ourselves. We have a whole duty to maintain this pure, not just our words, but our body, our mind, our soul, our spirit. And and we have to communicate in that way, and we have to take action in that way. See, there's churches out there that agree actually on our doctrine. There's probably churches around here that that are Baptists that believe that you know you're saved by grace through faith that you should go soul winning, they're King James only, but get them to go soul winning with us. Get them to go soul winning with, with uh, pure words. You know, that would be a, you know, an interesting day, right? I mean, I know that that's the reality because I've reached out to churches like that. I know Pastor Shelley has the same. And the minute they find out that you're associated with certain people, in this case, Pastor Anderson, right? I mean, that's, they don't want to have anything to do with you. That's, you know, that's what they say. That's what they do. And so, before we go into the points, let me just tell you that the world tries to pin you in the category, right? You're either Democrat or you're Republican, right? Or you're alt-right or you're alt-left, you know? And uh, But the one that I'm going to focus on today, because that's what I grew up in, is they'll try to tell you that in order to make yourself better, you have to self-improve or self-help. And the opposite of that is, look, if you don't do these things, if you don't implement these techniques, then you're going to have self-sabotage or self-destruction. Let me tell you something. Those are both, in my opinion, and I actually, I believe that it's actually correct from the Bible. Those are wrong because there's no such thing as self-help or self-destruction. You know, the Bible talks a lot about, look, we've read Genesis. If you get into Exodus and Leviticus, what does God tell them? Look, you're going to go into this land. And if you do these things, what do you get? The blessings. But if you don't do these things, what do you get? The cursing, right? What it is is, where are we putting our, you know, if we're focused on Christ, then our self-improvement isn't self-improvement. God's giving us that improvement. Now, I'm not against you improving, but make sure that your goals match the will of God. And if they don't, let Him guide you in that direction. And if you're being self-destructive, if you have that self-loathing or defeatist attitude, then maybe you're not reading the Word of God enough, right? You're not spending enough time in God's Word to realize that you're already victorious. Look, if, even if you fail the rest of your life, if you're saved, you've already conquered death. You've already got the victory. You know, I mean, you there's nothing there's nothing left to do. I mean, that's why the Bible, I, I love that verse, says we're more than conquered. Because, you know, if you conquer, you know, you get to the cities and you take everything and then you're like, what's next? Have you ever finished, like, you've had this big goal, and you're, like, working really hard at it, and you're at it, and you go, and, I mean, you're, and then you finally get the goal, and then you're like, oh, man, what do I do now? What's next? Like, I don't know what to, have you ever heard somebody say, well, I, I just got, reti- I just retired, I don't know what to do with my time. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going crazy. You know, that's why I love, you know, my, my father-in-law, he's, uh, they keep trying to get him to retire, and he won't retire because I think he's afraid that he won't know what to do with his time. So I, I know he's going to work till the day he dies it's because that's really what, you know, you want to have some activity. But let's go to the first point. The, go to Psalm 145. I just kind of wanted to wanted to set this up for you guys. So, you, there, you know, we want to focus our activity on God's plan. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with having leadership that matches that. So, for example, you guys have Pastor Shelley. You want to match your activity based on the goals of this church. You do. 
But you always want to make sure that the, the goals of this church are matching God's goals, which that shouldn't be a challenge in a church like this, right? I mean, it really shouldn't. And so Psalm 145, the first thing that we see is this is not just something that I'm, I'm taking out, you know, out of context. God takes action. You know, God is, as a matter of fact, we see there's a whole book called the book of Acts, you know, where God is in, you know, kind of given the action to who? The apostles. And, you know, we see this great movement and all of Christianity. Basically, that's like the, the, the explosion of Christianity, right? After Christ ascends and you have the day of Pentecost and then Paul and all these great stories in the book of Acts. But go there to Psalm 145. It says, David, in verse 1, it says, David's psalm of praise, I will exalt thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day I will bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, in his greatness is, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty, and of thy wondrous works, and men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts. And I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great, and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. All thy works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. So we see this psalm where it's talking about how God is just, he takes all these great actions, and he has all this great work, and we're all going to speak of it. That's the way we should live our lives. You know, the way we're going to improve our lives is to see what God has in store for us. The way we're going to get ready for the battle is to see what, how God deals with the battle. You know, I mean, it's even been said, and, and Brother Nick, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that throughout American military history, they've studied the Bible, for the military tactics. You know, that they've looked at how God prepared battles. You know why? Because God knows he, he does it the best. You know, I mean, that's really, the, but we shouldn't look at it for that reason. We should look at it because we want to win that spiritual battle. You know, right now, there's, there's, there's two groups in Washington. Apparently, you know, they're all getting ready to take up arms and all kinds of stuff. You know, it's a, it's a vain battle. It doesn't matter what side wins, it's still a vain battle. It's for power, it's for self-gain, it's vanity, the Bible says. Then, but we, we're preparing for the righteous battle. Amen. Every time you show up to church, you're sharpening that sword. Right. Every time you get up and you read your Bible, every time that you help a brother in Christ, every time that you implement the things that God's asked you, every time that you take action on the Word of God, then you're preparing for that battle. You might even be winning the battle. You might even be in the battle. I don't know. I mean, it just depends on, on your situation. But in Hebrews 11.1, 1, we all know this, this great verse, but I love the way that it, that it tied together. It says in Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. You know, I love that that verse because it's God's word that framed the world. You know, how do we take action with our words when we use God's words? So our actions are going to speak louder than words when our words are God's words because then God's words are going to create some big action, right? But it should all match up. I mean, like I said, that that's just the title because I don't know, maybe I was reminiscent about my age and I just kept thinking of all these old sayings that I grew up with, like actions speak louder than words. You get a checkup from the neck up, you know, things like that. You know, I don't know what, I don't know what the next generation, you know, with all the, the uh, text acronyms, they might not talk like we do, right? They just remember different things like LOL and, you know, I don't know what else. I, as a matter of fact, I have to look stuff up whenever pe people text me. You know, I have to go online and look up like the acronyms because I don't know what they mean. I don't know how I got off on that, but, but anyways. But the first thing I wanted you to see is that God is a God of action. We know that, but I wanted you know it's always good to give you Bible uh, backing for that. So you just, I'm not just pulling stuff out of the air. So He gives us that example. And by the way, who is the Word? Jesus. Amen. So if the Word creates action, and Jesus said that He left as an example, then what should we follow? Christ's example. So the only way for us to be effective in life 
as Christians, and in even our worldly life, and in our jobs, and in our homes, and everything, is to execute the Word of God. Nothing else matters. You heard it this morning. Your thoughts are vanity, God said. They're just vain. You know what vain means? They're just empty. They're fruit, fruitless. They have no purpose without Christ. And you don't want to have that because you want to be men of activity so that when leadership looks to you, they want to delegate to you. Because I know that they were literally looking over flocks, but it's a picture of the spiritual flocks that we have to look over in our lives, right? You know, the pastor's in charge of a flock and he needs to feed the flock. But even as Moses, he had to delegate out the judgments, right? His father-in-law was like, whoa, you've got too much on your plate. You need to delegate this out. Right? And so you might be in charge of a small portion of the flock. And you don't want to be like, uh, you know, like the wicked servant who said, oh, well, I knew you were austere, so I just hit, hit the talent because I didn't want you to be mad at me. You know, I didn't, I didn't want you to get, I didn't, I didn't want to get in trouble. And so point number two um, is in, uh, it, go to Isaiah 55. Sorry about that. And, um, you know, God's word, we saw that with Hebrews, is active and it's alive. It's the only book that is not only an action book. In other words, God takes action, but it's constantly coming true. I mean, case in point, today, if you followed any of the, the things, you know, you got a bunch of dogs barking at outside of churches, you know, because they're, they're offended. Yeah. I don't know what they're offended about. You know, dogs shouldn't be offended. <laughs> dogs are dogs, right? Right. But in Isaiah 55, 8, this is one of my, and by the way, this is probably my favorite verse when I prepare soul winning, for me personally. I just love this set of verses, but I'm actually applying it different. But 55, verse 8 says, for my thoughts... This is God speaking, are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, the Lord, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and making it bring forth and bud, that it may give the seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. And I love that part, because what do we do? We go soul winning. And we live by God's word. And it's, it's a great picture. So shall my word be that goeth out forward out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing with, whereto I sent it. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. You know, when I go soul winning, like, you know, you, you were talking about you're in a more, in a nicer neighborhood today, and you might not reap as much fruit. It's the only activity that doesn't matter the actual result. Because God's word doesn't return void. You don't need that instant gratification, meaning you don't need to get someone saved today to know that God's word's going to do his work. You just don't know what's going to happen. I mean, his thoughts and his ways are higher than our ways. For all we know, when we get to heaven, we're going to see all these people where, you know, we planted that seed and then somebody followed up, you know, some watered and some sowed and some reaped, some harvested. And then you see all the work that you did. Look, you're not doing it in vain. You're not. And I mean, I'm, I'm not, by the way, I've not gotten that spirit at all. But it can be discouraging when you go through tribulations. And it's just good to remind yourself that the battle's not over. It's just good to remind yourself that you're in it to win it, right? But you're in it to win it for Christ. Yeah. And I don't see that here. I don't sense that spirit at all. I'm just telling you that, you know, that's life. You know, you have your peaks and your valleys, but hopefully you're more like this, right? It's not like, you know, <laughs> although sometimes it feels like that, right? <laughs> you know, especially if you have kids and, and, you know, a life and a job and all that stuff. So, and then what I want to end with is a call to action. And this is a call to action to you guys here. You know, I want to tell you that you've got to take, you got to be men and women of activity. And you probably know this. And like I said, today, my goal was not to come here and give you some like new revelation or new doctrine. It was to reinforce the things that you already know and just reinforce them with the word of God. See, if I said anything that, that you know, I read some stuff earlier today and 
I've given you some personal stories. If you don't like them, fine. Just throw them out the window. But if everything that's from the Word of God, you know, apply it in your life. Right, right there, uh, turn over to 1 Samuel 2. 1 Samuel 2. We see this played out in different scenarios. And this is the, you, you know, we know the famous story, 1 Samuel 1. Hannah st- prays to God. She wants a, the womb's not opened up. And she's like, if you give me a son, I'll give him back to you. And we see this, and, and she sings this, and, and says in 1 Samuel 2, 1, and Hannah, I mean, she prays this, I, I apologize. The song was this morning, which, by the way, I forgot to mention, Isaiah 26. We should make that into a song, because that's what it is. It's the song, you're right? You know, it's a, it's a song that's being sung in, in Isaiah 26. It'd be pretty cool to put it to music. But anyways, that's another. If somebody's good with music, make it. That'd be really cool to hear. In 1 Samuel 2, 1, it says, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over my enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. There's none holy as the Lord, for there's none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our our God. Talk no more exceedingly proudly. Let not arrogance come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge. And by his actions, and by him, actions are weighed. So God pays attention to our actions. Basically, I mean, you know she's praying this because she, she, made a, she made this vow, and now she's keeping it. And she has this correct fear of the Lord. She didn't, you know, uh, she has this correct fear, like, I'm, I don't want to get that wrath or, the, or that punishment of God. She's keeping her word, and she's saying, this is a good thing. She's exalting God. And what does she say at there at the end? And by him, actions are weighed. See, you know, don't worry about how to weigh your actions. Don't worry about how others weigh your actions. What you need to be worried about is how God weighs your actions, right? Sometimes we look at our lives, and, and if we start comparing, you know, it can get pretty depressing pretty quick, right? You, you run into, that's why I hate social media in a way. I mean, I think it's good for the gospel. You know, we should use all the tools. But if you get on there too long, you start seeing old friends, and maybe they drive a nicer car or a nicer home. You can depress yourself real quick. But you don't know, you know, what we need to do is, how does God view our life? How does God view our actions? And I'm not talking, you know, that's why I said this is for you. If you're, this is for the saved. This is not a, a work salvation, by the way. Let me make that clear. But God does expect us, he says it's, it's our duty, our reasonable service to serve him. Yeah. Right? I mean, the Bible, it, it, it likens it to being wicked and slothful if you don't go out so when. I mean, God talks constantly about that. Now, I mean, you can be in heaven. It says that there's going to be some that are least in the kingdom. So obviously, some of them are going to be least, but they'll be there. I mean, it's for eternity. But I don't know. I just don't, I don't want to get there like that. And and I'm older, and, you know, time just keeps going fast. So I got to catch up. I got to do some some extra work. You know, I mean, those, these young guys, you guys got it all set up, and that's good. Go to Psalm 31. And then after Psalm, we'll be in James. So just turn to Psalm 31, and then we're going to be in James. <clears throat> but just, just to recap real quick, I mean, God takes action. Obviously, the Bible, we believe, is, is alive, as you've heard in the past, but it's an, it's an active book. This, this, this actually is a living word. It's not like any other book ever written in the history of the world. I mean... The world does it. That's why the world does it. You know how the, we always say that. You, know, you hear that a lot. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit. It's because it's not until you get saved that you start to see how God works through His Word in your life and in the lives of others. Right. Not only that, in the world, the events that are unfolding right now, who would have thought that a virus would bring the world together? You know, everybody speculated how this one world thing would happen. And we know now that the world's all on one accord. Now, it's just a matter of what agenda they want to feed. Right now, it's a virus. Eventually, it'll just be a one-world government. Then what? A one-world religion. Then, you know, the Antichrist and all that stuff, right? But let me not get off on tangent. But you're there in Psalm 31. And the Bible says, O love the Lord, all ye saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully re- rewardeth the proud doer. It didn't say the guy who just reads his Bible and shows up to church. It says the doer. 
you know, when you're doing the things. It says, be of good courage. And he shall strengthen your heart, all ye hope, all ye that hope in the Lord. I, I believe that verse follows that. Because you know what? When you're doing the word of God, guess what happens? Attacks. Right? Do you think it's a coincidence that faithful word, I mean, uh, First Works Baptist Church in, in California is doing what they're doing, and all of a sudden they're getting attacked? No. What did he say? Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. All ye that hope in the Lord. But it says, rewardeth proud doer. James, uh, you're, I asked you to turn to James. James 1, verse 19 says, Wherefore, James 1, verse 19 says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and super, uh, superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Stop lying to yourself. Stop lying, you know, I need, we all need to stop lying to ourselves. And there's, we, we have things we need to stop lying to ourselves about. Maybe some have more than others, but, but he says, stop lying to yourselves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he be not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious and brighteth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. You know what I mean? The Bible says in Galatians 5, it's the fruit of the Spirit, right? The Bible talks about, I love those verses because it starts out with the works of the flesh and then the fruit of the Spirit. But for us, we have it's work for us after we're saved. It says, don't be a hearer of the word only. Do it. You know why? Because if you don't do it, what does it say? You're going to forget it. How many of you probably now... You know, you've gone soul winning so much, you're already moving on. You're already, like, your thumb's, like, almost, like, automatic. You're like a robot, right? You're like, you know, for, you know, for God, what is it? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You're already turning, and you're, like, almost on the right page by the time you're moving on. Because you're doing the work, right? And you can quote the verses in your mind. If you were to lose your Bible, if somebody took it from you, you could still probably give the gospel presentation, right? Because you're doing the work. You're constantly at it. You're reading your Bible. You're going out there and you're pounding the pavement. But somebody else, you know, I remember before, you know, I remember when I got saved, I, I, I have, I've always had this, this, this burning desire to just lead others to Christ. I just don't understand how anybody who knows that will allow people to just go to hell without giving them a chance. But I didn't have the proper, you know, leadership. I didn't have the, pro and I'm not making excuses. I'm just telling you where I was at. And I remember that I, I, I printed out the Romans Road you know, the, the, the most popular one that most people know, and, you know, it, it jumped to maybe Revelation. And I'd give the gospel, like, a couple of times a year, and it was the most frustrating thing because I was always determined, after this, I'm going to memorize this thing. I'm just going to memorize it. And I never did. And I'd forget it, so I'd have to print it up. Someone's like, I'm, they're giving me an opportunity, and here I am, like, stumbling through the verses and, you know, fumbling over myself, looking, and this person's like, the only... You know when it when it stuck? When I started soul winning regularly. You know when I started getting in the battle regularly? I didn't I didn't hate queer. I didn't. You know, when I got saved, I was like, as long as they don't hurt me or let them do their thing, leave me alone, do my thing. You start doing the work, you start seeing how wicked of a world you live in. You start hating a couple people. Really? You really do. And I mean, and I'm still learning, I'm still working at it. I still want to be even stronger in the battle. 
I want to thicken that armor or make it better. You know, I guess you don't want a thick armor because it's too heavy. Maybe a thin armor that's like really strong, right? Like <laughs> a really good metal that can be like real light but still stop a bullet or something. But that's what we're looking for. We want to just be light, be able to battle, be able to go out there and do the work of the Lord. We want to take action. Uh, go over to Colossians 3.15. Go over to Colossians 3.15. And the Bible says there, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Isn't that interesting? Because we do a lot of things that I don't know that I do them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This should be something we should ingrain in our mind so that everything that we... God, I mean, it says everything and whatsoever ye do. I mean, maybe you guys might think it's a little exaggerated, but I mean, he, if He's saying whatsoever we do, like, I mean, how we brush our teeth, how we prepare our meals... You know, how we dress, how we talk to others, what battles we pick. I mean, seriously. And you think, that might sound a little exaggerated. I don't think so. I mean, there's nothing else in our lives after Christ. Nothing matters. Everything is vain, the Bible says. Even my thoughts are vanity without Christ. Why would I want to waste my time in anything else? Now, you're going to, I mean, sorry to tell you, but it's going to happen. I hate to... To, to burst your bubble, but you're going to leave here and you're going to be like, I won't, you're not. But you can improve and get there. You can get pretty close, I think. I really believe that. I think some of these guys, some of these pastors in this movement, some of the guys in these churches that we know, they're, they're closer than, than some of us. You know, it's, it's great. And we should look at them as an example, not as an envy or covetousness, which sometimes happens, right? And that leads me to the thing, because I know... I mean, let's not pretend like, I mean, I know social media exists, even though I don't use it a lot. You know, I know the things that happen. And I don't know everything that's going on, but for me, that one's personal because I was here when this thing started. I was here day one, you know, and I was here when you guys had a, a wolves in sheep clothing by the name of Manly Perry in here, right. right? And not only that, before Pure Words, I was the one who received a lot of people that were traveling from Houston to San Antonio and we were out there soul winning. This is a person that we thought, okay, this is a good guy. And you've got to be able, this is why I prepared you from this morning to now, to be able to view the words and the action, yeah. right? right because they can be deceptive. Yeah. You've got to pay attention. See, I mean, sometimes the red flags might come come quicker for some others. You know, for me, I've been a business owner all my life. I think I've had maybe one or two like actual clock in jobs in my entire life. Most of my life I've, I've been on my own contractor, 1099, whatever you want to call it. So you have to learn to deal with people. You know, one of the things you have to learn to deal with is you have to learn how to read people because people are wicked and they're going to backstab you. So you have to be ready to move on a dime. Like you have to be ready to just pivot your, your whole situation quickly because you know they're about to do something deceptive to stab you in the back, right? And so sometimes I, I listen to stuff, and I'm like, whoa, that sounds very similar to things that I've dealt with in my life, in my business, with my people. You know, and I don't know if you guys know, but for me, I know you know, or, or you probably know, you just haven't heard, and I don't know that you need to, but apparently there's been like these two uh, podcasts, right? And I, I didn't listen to the first one. The only reason I actually listened to the second one was last Saturday I was coming back from the soul winning that we did with Steadfast and Pure Words down, in, and so I'm driving. It's late at night, and it popped up like somebody no, it notified me on Facebook, and I clicked, and you know you put on double speed, and it actually kept me awake because I'm listening, I'm trying to pay attention. For the last hour of the trip, I was I was over there by like Wharton, you know, it's about an hour here, and you know I'm driving, I'm listening to this thing, and different things stood out, and obviously they've been addressed. But the one thing that really stood out to me was the ending. And by the way, you don't need to listen to it. I'm going to paraphrase it for you. 
But there was a couple of things that really stood out. There's a couple of false positives that were thrown in there. And this is what I was talking to you about earlier about the way that people speak, you know, how they feed the subconscious. And this is why that, that title, I guess, came to me, Actions Speak Louder Than Words, because sometimes the words are the action, right? And I know that sounds confusing, but just bear with me a second. But at the end of the thing, uh, you know, he's, uh, Manly Perry's talking, and he says, he's talking about this book that was given to him by the sword of the Lord from some other pastor up uh, in the Northeast. And it was from the 70s, and he's like, this book talks about the 20 biggest or, large, or fastest growing churches in America. This is back in the 70s. And he says, and it mentions, uh, you know, Pastor Curtin Hudson and right alongside Pastor Jack Hiles, which I don't know if you've heard of them, but, you know, I think those are good pastors. I don't necessarily agree with everything. I don't think anybody ever agrees with everything, you know. But those are, and he says, and there was another pastor was mentioned, and he says, don't confuse them with Bob Gray and Bob Gray Jr. over here. It's a Bob Gray Jr. out of Jacksonville, uh, Florida. Which, by the way, I don't know what's up with Jacksonville. I mean, I just, <laughs> I'm not kidding. This is like, this is back in the, in, in the early 2000s and 90s. And I do remember this now, um, I maybe mid-2000s. Mid and it says, and, he's, and he goes on, and I'm paraphrasing this, but I'm listening to this, and I, I, I made some notes here. It says, they have one of the fastest soul-winning churches in America. This is Manly Perry talking. And he says, I'm telling you, brother, that they were blowing and going and getting people saved like crazy. So what is he doing right now? He's telling you how great they are, right? He's, he's setting this thing up in a positive light. And he's like, and they were raving about what a huge ministry he had. Uh, even Tim Tebow, now, now, now he's people pleasing. I mean, that's really what, why would you drop Tim Tebow in a conversation if you're an independent fundamental Baptist? Forget New IB. I don't know any independent fundamental Baptist would be like, Tim Tebow's great. Tim Tebow, I, I've never, I don't, I don't know his gospel message. I, I've never heard one that's clear. We were talking about confusion and clarity this morning. I, I've not, if you've heard it, and I don't want to bring a railing accusation. If you've heard it, let me know. I've not heard it. And I've, you know, I, I try to follow things as much as possible. And he goes, uh, he goes, even Tim Tebow went to this Christian school. So this church grew, you know, that was common back then. And then they, they'd have a school, you know, a prominent Christian school or whatever. And then he says, and then he goes back and he repeats that first part about this guy was in the, in the same likes as Curtin Hudson and Jack Hiles. You know, he's like Bob Gray. Then this is the part where it gets real interesting. He goes, the whole while, I mean, but he switches it up real quick. He goes, you know, this guy was in the same realm as Pastor Jack Hiles and Curtin Hudson, so he makes it very positive. And then immediately he just says, the whole while he's praying on children. He says, I've read there were numerous red flags. And he goes on, he talks a little bit about it. He goes, but then he says this, and he takes a long pause. And he goes, but he got a pass. And guess why he got a pass? Because of all of his fruit. When you preach the word of God, brother, it is so powerful, something's going to happen. It don't matter who it's coming from. He got a pass for all his fruit. And then this is how he closed it out to remind you that he's still, you know, a good old fundamental for the wicked, wicked things he was doing. What in the world? That's confusing. You know, I have a friend who, has, who knows nothing about the new IFB. He goes to our church. I played it for him. I wanted to make sure that I wasn't reading too much into this. I was like, you know what, let me just get a third party. And I said, I'm going to play this clip for you, no context. And you tell me what, what you think. And he goes, that's reckless. That was his, his reaction. His initial reaction was, that's reckless. Who cares? I mean, why would you bring that? How does that edify brothers and sisters in Christ? How is that a call to action is what I mean. You know, we're talking about activity. How does that create someone who says, oh, you know what? I want to go join your church because you're a great soul winner. Even if there was pedophilia amongst us, it doesn't matter because as long as there's good fruit, well, then, you know, we're all going to be okay. How is that even, does that make sense? Like, how is that not confusing? You know why I feel comfortable coming to Pure Word? That I can bring my wife and children. I'm not saying, I mean, I, we know there's bad people everywhere. There's wolves. But for the most part, there's, there's parameters set apart, right? 
you know, I was giving my wife the tour, and I said, there's the baby mama, uh, baby mother room. I said, you know what? Feel comfortable taking the kids in there. No men allowed. Good. I don't want any, you know, I don't want Manly Perry within 10 feet of my children. And I, let me be very clear. I'm not saying that he is anything. I have no, no knowledge of that. But anybody who turned a blind eye to somebody who was doing that yeah. would turn a blind eye to somebody doing that to my children. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to be the guilty party. If you didn't do anything about it, you're just as guilty. What do you mean you get a pass? I think the Bible is very clear. I mean, let's go to the Bible because I, I actually have the verses. But the Bible says there, go to Matthew 18. And before we go to Matthew 18, you know what Romans 1 says. Right. I, if you don't know what Romans 1 says, you know, I'll call Pastor Sean and be like, hey, some of your people didn't know what Romans 1 says. Like, oh, what's going on? <laughs> Are you not preached on Romans 1? I mean, I'm just... <laughs> right? What does it say? It's unnatural. We're not talking about a natural sin here. The Bible is clear. The Bible says in Matthew 18, 3... Oh, okay, I know what I did. Okay, I got... I mean, I got my notes here, but they combined... I combined two. I was like, I know I'm missing a verse. Now I see it. But go to Matthew 18, verse 3, and it says, And said, Verily I said unto you, uh, say unto you, Except ye be converted, this is Jesus speaking, and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. You know, we were talking about how we should have a childlike mentality. That's why God protects us, because he doesn't want us to be abused, even as adults. He doesn't. And I'm not just talking about the abuse that we're referring to here. I'm just talking in general. He didn't, he's not going to allow the world and the devil to just attack us and get away with it. We're his little children. So us, we have to look out for the little children. It says, uh, Ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself, verse 4, as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And who shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But who shall offend, who shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Right. Look, the only solution for someone like that was to... Now, let me make one thing clear. I don't know anything about this church. I didn't have enough time to do. I'm pretty sure there were safe people there that were so winning that have led people to Christ, right? Because, we, you know, people get saved. What I'm saying is I don't believe that this Bob Gray Jr. led anybody to Christ. Just like I don't believe Judas led anybody to Christ. Right. I don't think he had any fruit. Actually, you know what? He did have fruit, right? But it had bad fruit. Because it was a corrupt tree bringeth forth what? Corrupt fruit. corrupt fruit. So he did have, but not that good fruit. Right. So he didn't get a pass in God's eyes. Right. So I don't care what Manly Perry or anybody else says. God says that it had been better for him to be thrown in the sea. You know, the Bible, turn over to Mark. And just keep a finger there in Matthew, because we're going to be back, and that's where I'm going to close out. But in Matthew, in Mark 9, we see this again, but it's worth repeating. Mark 9, 42 says, And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he were cast into the sea. God's not going around being like, well, because of his fruit, don't hang him in the sea. But then... God would, you know, that's, that, that's confusing. Even the way he set it up, the way he said it is confusing. Why would you do that? Even if you wanted to give someone the benefit of the doubt, it's kind of hard when you make such a confusing statement. You know when you do something like that, when you're trying to manipulate somebody? Right? I know that you've heard the term, I know Pastor Shelley's preached on gaslighting. You know, that's what you do. It's, it's, it's a form of manipulation. Right? It's to make you think that what you were thinking was wrong, that maybe you need to be corrected by somebody else. You know, you're going crazy. Did I just hear what I thought I heard? No, you didn't hear it. Because what will happen is, they'll start, you know, what I really meant to say was, or what I really was trying to accomplish was, that, you know, we've heard already stuff like that. Right? But your call to action is you need to be able to discern that type of language. Because you don't know who's walking in this church. You don't know me. I mean, I'm serious. Protect your families. And, and I'm not, by the way, I mean, but you don't, right? You don't know me. You, you've only heard of me. You should be careful. And you know what? I should not be offended that you're careful with your family. 
I should not. And if I am, you, you, I shouldn't be invited back. Or honestly, that's that's the truth. And honestly, if you're offended, you shouldn't be invited back. I mean, I mean, because that's the one differentiating, like one of the big things that differentiates churches like this from others is that they're willing to protect the flock. It's not just to preach to the flock, but they're willing to protect the flock. They're willing to expose sin for what it is. And I'm not talking about like, oh, you know, brother so-and-so was lying to me or whatever. I'm talking about like the serious sin. You know what I mean? I'm talking about the sin that causes permanent damage. You know, if one of the children, one of these little girls that was abused by this man was listening to that, what do you think that would do to her? The kind of mental anguish that would cause to hear something like that. It'd be so defeated to say, I have nobody to fight for me. Because that doesn't sound like someone who's fighting for the victimless. You know what I mean? For the victims, I'm sorry. For those that don't have somebody to fight for them. But go over to Matthew 6. We'll close out with this. So, in closing, because you're like, well, how, what, how are you going to tie this all together? I set this up, right? This, this guy's going around making this podcast because he didn't like being called out. And he's dropping names now, like Jack Hiles and Curtin Hudson, Tim Tebow, apparently dropping that name. And now he's trying to make himself like this famous guy. He's trying to join up with people who hate Pastor Steven Anderson and the new IFB. You know, he's making a name for himself. My call to action to you is if nobody ever finds out your name, nobody ever finds out who you are, if Pure Words never makes it on the map, but you do things for the Lord and the Lord notices your work, that's all that matters. Amen. Now, I, I don't believe that's going to happen because I know that God says we're, it's a light on a shining hill. As a matter of fact, I know that on the 25th of December, I mean, 25th of January, you know, there's a movie coming out, a documentary. <laughs> It's going to shine a big old light on pure words and steadfast. I mean, let, let's not kid ourselves, right? Amen. You might have, like, news crews out here and <laughs> protesters and all kinds. So be ready. That's right. It'll be an exciting time. Right. It'll be a good time. You, know, you guys have fun making fun of all that, right? <laughs> but Matthew 6, verse 1 says, Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore... When thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have the glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. They have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which see them in secret, shall reward thee openly. Who's seen him? Your Father in heaven. We're almost... And verse 5 says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue or on YouTube comments. Seriously. And in the corners of the street that they may be seen of men, verily I say unto you that they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, prayest, Enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, th thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. See, it's fun sometimes, because I think human nature likes drama, right? You want to attach yourself to a movement when, the, when, when it was good. But then when things got tough, all of a sudden you don't want to be around. And the challenge is, that, you know, you see people like, like a Pastor Shelley or a Pastor Anderson or a Pastor Mejia. And, and I mean, they're, they're good preachers and, and, and they're out there. And sometimes we see and you're like, man, I just, look, what you're doing counts just as much. Sometimes maybe even more. You know, I sometimes like to think, not of the ones that, that are in the spotlight, but of all those names in history that have been martyred for the name of Christ, yeah. that have been persecuted for the name of Christ, that have been attacked for the name, that we don't know, we, we, we wouldn't know their names or their family history or where they came from until we get to heaven. 
We don't know of all the guys that just showed up to pure words. And on Sunday, we're faithful, and they went to the soul winning times, and they just pounded the pavement. Nobody knew their name. As a matter of fact, if they didn't show up to church, nobody even missed them. But God knows. God knows what you're doing. Right? There's a guy, I went to this church, and I'm not, it, it, LaVon Drive Baptist Church in, in, uh, in Garland, Texas. And I remember it was a very frustrating experience. It's, it's very old IFB, you know, and it was a good, it was, it was frustrating, but it wasn't a horrible experience. It was just a frustrating experience. But one guy stands out to me. Uh, every Saturday, it was weird. Every Sunday they would announce and they were like, so-and-so, I forget his name. Um, but every, they were like, Saturday, so-and-so, the soul winning ministry downtown with so-and-so. And I mean, it was like every Sunday. On Saturday at 10, 10 a.m., Brother so-and-so is going soul winning, blah, 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 if you want to join him. So one Saturday, I decided to join him. You know, because like I said, I wanted, I wanted to learn. And I went. It was a frustrating experience. Obviously, you're just catching people off the street. He didn't give me very much training. But I think of him. I can't even remember his name right now. But I think about he's been diligently doing that. Nobody joined him in that church. This church had like three, 400 members just by himself, maybe two, three people. But every Sunday... I mean, every Saturday, he's just faithful, going out there and preaching the gospel and trying to lead people, pulling them out of hell. And I think to myself, when he gets to heaven, you know, like we're going to find out this guy probably like turned the world upside down in his area. I mean, nobody, it, people just ignored that ministry. A big church, and they just like, it was in passing. They're like, oh, you know, Saturday, join this, blah, blah, blah. He would show up whether anybody showed up. You know, are you going to show up if nobody shows up? That's really the question. Are you going to go soul winning if nobody goes soul winning? Right now it's great, but are you going to do the same things when the persecution comes? The Bible says, and yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, right? This church is founded on the rock. It's a church that's trying to live godly. You know what's coming? It's knocking at your door. <laughs> it's not very far away. But are you going to be here when it counts? You know, and probably the reality is some of you might not be here in a couple of years. You're not going to like it. You're going to, and usually the excuses come in different forms, right? You're really running away from the battle. But it's like I didn't like so and so, or the pews were not the color I wanted, or that mural. What's up? With, I'm. I think it's a great mural, by the way. But you know, people people look up for excuses of things, right? That piano, you hear the excuses, but the reality is they're not showing up because they're just not willing to take action. They're not men and women of activity. So be active, but don't just be busybodies. Don't just do things to do them. Have a purpose. It doesn't have to be this big, grandiose goal. I mean, just purpose yourself to read the Bible this year. You know, we're already on the 17th. Most of you are like, oh man, it's 15 days. Let me start all over. Whatever, if you have to start all over again, don't give up. You're like, I've never, I've not been consistent in so many. Do it this year. I've not been a good prayer warrior. Do it this year. What's holding you back? Nothing. You know, I've not been a good husband or a good wife. Do it this year. You know, people are so bitter at their husbands and wives all the time because you know what? They're not willing to forgive. The Bible says forgive everybody. But it's always hardest to forgive your, your spouse, right? Or your kids or family members. Just do it. You'd be surprised what God will do in your life. So anyways, I hope that was, you know, something that I wanted to leave you with. I wanted to give you guys just just a, I don't know, a swift kick. I'm not, I mean, but, you know, just to get you going, get you, get you pumped up and get you ready for the year. You know, the 25th is only around the corner. So it's coming. So better be ready, right? Why not prepare now? So let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, Lord. Thank you that there are still churches in this country and in this world that are willing to serve. And Lord, help us to find men of activity. You know, men that will go out there and not complain because their flock's not as big as other flocks or their duties are not as important as other duties. The reality is the only concern we should have is to be seen of you in secret and to be rewarded of you openly. And I, I mean, we know you're going to do it. That's your promise, but we shouldn't go into it thinking, oh, where's my, we should just do it. We should serve because you are our Lord and you are our King. 
and everything else is vain. So thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to preach today. Thank you for such a wonderful church and such a wonderful invitation and, and gracious hosts. And uh, just be with pure words, be with steadfast, be with uh, Pastor Shelley, and be with all those that are in the fight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.